All right. Okay, people are signing up. All right, just uh, for those who are, are signed in, attending, attendees, we'll just uh, get started in a couple minutes. <clears throat> All right. I don't have that on. She's got no audio? No. Okay. He's going to have to be able to speak at some point. Yeah. Okay, I'll call her and then we'll get started. We're just having a little bit of trouble getting audio from one of the presenters, so we'll just be another minute. Mm -hmm. Get started. Uh, Alan Hilo, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for um, tuning into the um, United Nations Declaration of Rights Indigenous webinar. Uh, my ancestral name is Hapolaksa. My English name is Kirby Moldo. I am uh, a descendant of the Kixan and Timsian nations. Uh, welcome. We are hosting this webinar from the unceded uh, Wet'suwet'en territory. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been working with uh, Paul and Jennifer to organize presentations throughout Northwest British Columbia uh, to better inform people on the UN Declaration and to be able to um, have dialogue to, to be able to have questions and answers as we will today. With the passing of the uh, BC Declaration Act, we thought this webinar could help provide some history and some, some significance to the Declaration. And a couple of examples of how First Nations expect to engage on their territory. Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nikki Skews, and I'm the director of the Northern Confluence Initiative, which is on the shared platform of Tides Canada. 
and uh, we're here in Smithers on Wet'suwet'en territory. And um, so just before we get started, I just would like to point out uh, for those unfamiliar, um, there's a Q&A button there at the bottom and um, Kirby and I are gonna be monitoring questions that come in. And after we hear from all the presenters, uh, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. Um, so to begin with, I'd like to introduce you to Paul Joff and Jennifer Preston, who uh, spent 20 years uh, working with the development as the, as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was developed and are currently working on its implementation. Is the is the PowerPoint showing? Yes. Okay. Um, great. Thank you to uh, Nikki and to Kirby. Except I think I am now not controlling the advancing of the slides. Um, hang on. Let me see if I can make that happen. Uh, Oh, okay. So uh, thank you very much, Nikki and Kirby, for inviting us to be part of this webinar. And um, uh, yeah, Paul and I are coming to people today from the traditional territories of Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples um, in both what is now known as Ontario and Quebec. Um, I have here on the screen uh, the booklet version of the UN Declaration. Paul and I are both involved with the Coalition for the Human Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and uh, which is an informal group of individuals and organizations who came together originally during the development of the Declaration and continue to work together uh, on the implementation. And I've got on the screen, you see the website of the Coalition, where there's a lot of different educational resources on the Declaration. So I encourage people to um, check that out in terms of getting further information and then builds on what we'll be sharing today. And while what we're sharing today and the webinar today is not currently on the critical situation that's taking place in Wet'suwet'en territory, we do briefly wanna to speak to this as it does raise serious human rights issues. And as you can see from the two slides, the two quotes that are on this slide, one of them is from the UN and one is from Canada in its submission to the UN. Uh, the relationship between the rule of law and human rights is fundamental, and it's not responsible or acceptable to be merely stating that it adherence to the rule of law when human rights are being violated. And part of the legacy, the harmful legacy of colonization that's continuing today is a disrespect of hereditary governments. And it's concerning that in the injunction decision that came down from BC Supreme Court does not address colonialism, reconciliation, human rights, uh, Chilcotin decision, or the declaration. And it's problematic that in fact that ruling is being relied on to legitimize police action. Human rights defenders should not be criminalized. Land defenders are protecting inherent indigenous title and rights and exercising the right of self-determination. This is recognized and affirmed in both Canadian and international law. And the declaration affirms rights and related obligations to ensure that conflicts like this will not be addressed violently, but rather resolved collaboratively with negotiated solutions. And when the declaration is being implemented in good faith, such situations should have reached redress long before reaching a critical impasse. So this is what Paul and I are gonna quickly go through uh, over the next 20 minutes. Um, just a little bit of background on the declaration. Uh, Paul will speak to uh, legal significance in FPIC. <laughs> We'll touch on both the federal and provincial legislation and finish up with a, just a word on implementation. So in terms of the background, in, in, in the interest of time in this webinar, I'm gonna make this really brief, um, but there are obviously longer versions of this available. So indigenous peoples worked uh, for more than two decades with states at the UN to develop the declaration through the processes of two different UN working groups. That makes it the longest discussed instrument in the history of the United Nations. Another unique feature 
is that it was also the first time and to date only where a human rights instrument was being developed with the rights holders themselves, indigenous peoples, as participants in the consensus. The UN likes to do their work by consensus. Um, and in this, in this particular journey, there was a point in the second working group where indigenous peoples insisted that the process, which was at that point totally unfair, had to be addressed because for member states to be negotiating what would be in this instrument, while indigenous peoples did not have the same um, opportunity to make a contribution, was obviously not acceptable. So the way that this was handled was basically um, to get around UN rules of how UN meetings take place. They made the working group informal. So in that way, indigenous peoples could play same role that member states were playing in the working group. And the working group agreed. The consensus in the working group meant that, um, or included the indigenous representatives, not just uh, this member states. So that was also a very unique feature um, in the development of the instrument and also of course why it took so long. So um, uh, what, what became the declaration, there was originally an adoption of an original text in June of 2006. Um, that text had further amendments once it went to New York into the General Assembly. There was another year of, of a politicking. Um, but then in September of 2007, this is the day of the adoption. This is the General Assembly Hall in the UN. Um, we had uh, 144 states vote in favor, 11 states abstained, four states voted against. All four of the states that voted against have formally reversed their positions, which now makes it a consensus instrument. And this is important um, for its legal significance. It's also important at the UN, you know, as I said, they like to do their work by consensus. So it increases its significance at the international level as well. And to date, the declaration has been affirmed, reaffirmed by the General Assembly by consensus 11 times. There's no state in the world that formally opposes the declaration. So the declaration was not about creating new rights. The rights in the declaration are inherent or pre-existing human rights of indigenous peoples. And they were articulated in a manner to reflect the ongoing challenges that indigenous peoples face around the globe. It was widely known. There's approximately 400 million indigenous people in more than 70 countries around the world. And it was widely known that they continue to be the most discriminated against, the most dispossessed, and continue to suffer extreme human rights violations. So the declaration is a rich instrument that affirms both individual and collective rights, as well as state responsibilities to ensure that the rights are fulfilled. And this, it, we don't have time to get into the, all the content of the declaration, obviously, but it includes provisions that deal with language rights, culture, media, education, health, housing, spirituality, land, traditional knowledge, treaties, the environment, uh, the right to development, sustainable development, much more. So. You see that uh, so many different uh, critical issues that Indigenous peoples are dealing with all the time are encompassed uh, in the Declaration. Critically, the Declaration affirms Indigenous peoples' right of self-determination. And the preamble of the Declaration lays out a very rich context and the general provisions at the conclusion provide balance. Human rights declarations are meant to be read as a whole and individual provisions are not to be interpreted in isolation. We do, need, uh, we do need legislation now in Canada, federal as well as provincial, um, precisely because Indigenous people's human rights have been violated for so long and the violations are continuing. And I think we can all agree that the status quo uh, is not working and it's not acceptable. So now I'm just gonna hand it over to Paul for the next few slides. Morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, let's now examine the legal significance of the UN Declaration. And in this 1987 decision, former Chief Justice Brian Dixon of the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that declarations and other international human rights sources are, and you see it at the bottom of the slide, relevant and persuasive sources for interpreting the Canadian Charter's provisions. 
So if international declarations are used to interpret human rights in the Canadian Charter, which is in part one of the Constitution Act 1982, then the same must be true for Indigenous people's human rights in part two, section 35. To conclude otherwise would be a discriminatory double standard. Next. Now, the UN Declaration is not binding in the same manner as treaties, but it does have diverse legal effects. For example, you see three on the uh, slide. Governments and others may use the Declaration for law policy development and decision making. Canadian courts may and actually are using the Declaration to interpret Indigenous peoples' rights and related government obligations and treaty bodies internationally may use it to interpret other international human rights instruments. Next. Now in 2012, the Federal Court of Canada ruled that international instruments such as the UN Declaration and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, since it was a case involving First Nations children, may inform the contextual approach to statutory interpretation. In other words, to have a full context relating to Indigenous peoples, one can rely on the UN Declaration. And at the bottom of the slide, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal indicated that of particular significance, especially in this case, is the UN Declaration. And you see a reference to numerous paragraphs in that uh, decision of the tribunal, and they relate to numerous articles of the UN Declaration. Next. Now the truth in, well, we're looking at the case of Pastion versus Dene Tha First Nation in 2018. And this was uh, where the federal court underlined that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or TRC, indicated that recognition of Indigenous people's power to make laws is central to reconciliation. And the UN Declaration echoes these aspirations. And the court quoted Article 34 of the UN Declaration, and you see it on the slide. And so Indigenous peoples have the right to promote, develop, maintain, their institutional structures and their distinctive customs, spirituality, etc. And in cases where they exist, juridical systems, which refers to Indigenous court systems, as well as customs, and all of this in accordance with international human rights standards. Next. Now let's turn to free prior and informed consent, or FPIC, as it's sometimes called. And we have here one of the provisions that explicitly refers to the um, to FPIC in the UN Declaration. You see others uh, quoted at the cited at the bottom of the slide. And in the first part, Article 32.1 you can see that it's closely linked to Indigenous peoples' right to self-determination, since it deals with development of lands, territories, and resources. Now, with respect to Article 32.2, where there are direct impacts on Indigenous peoples' lives or territories, it could well mean that a specific project would require FPIC and significant changes may, be, may have to be made into that project. And just to mention, uh, FPIC is relative and not absolute uh, factors, because I should also mention that human rights are generally relative and not absolute. The only absolute rights are exceptions, such as the right not to be subjected to genocide or torture, or slavery, slavery or apartheid, and their related state obligations. Now, factors to consider when one is looking at 
are such questions as, is the proposed development sustainable? Are indigenous people's own development priorities being respected? Are their cultures safeguarded? Are indigenous people's own means of subsistence being undermined? Thank you. Uh, sorry, next slide. Now, FPIC or consent does not originate from the UN Declaration. Uh, the UN Declaration does not create any new rights, and it indicates clearly in par preambular paragraph seven that the rights are inherent. So where does consent come from? And it actually comes from the right of self-determination in common article one of the two international covenants and you can see their names at the bottom of the slide. Now, the right of self-determination includes the right to choose. It's the right to say yes, the right to say no, and the right to say yes with conditions. Indigenous peoples have their own internal processes before reaching such decisions. Now, we have only time for to look briefly at this article, so I'm looking at the third paragraph, three, Article 1, 3, which includes an affirmative obligation of states, including Canada, to promote and respect the right of self-determination. Now, Canada ratified the two covenants in 1976. That's over 40 years ago. Yet self-determination and consent of Indigenous peoples have not been fully acknowledged and respected by governments in Canada. Thanks. Now, in the new federal act respecting Indigenous languages, which was adopted in June uh, 2019, it is highlighted in the preamble that the government of Canada recognizes that all relations with Indigenous peoples must be based on the recognition and implementation of their right to self-determination, which includes the inherent right of self-government. Now, the phrase all relations goes well beyond the Indigenous Languages Act and applies to other, for example, other legislation. And all of this has to be consistent with Canada's international legal obligations to respect and promote Indigenous peoples' right to self-determination in all relevant matters. Next. Now, we would like to emphasize that there is no significant difference between FPIC in international law and consent in Canadian law. And as illustrated on this slide, on both instances, when we are addressing consent, there must be no coercion or manipulation. Consent must be obtained in advance of the activity being approved. And information provided must not be misleading or inadequate. Without these elements, there would not be valid consent. Next. Now, prior to addressing the case on this slide, Haida Nation, it is worth recalling that in Chilcotin Nation versus British Columbia in 2014, the Supreme Court ruled that governments and others seeking to use Indigenous land must obtain the consent of Indigenous title holders. Now, in our view, it's uh, Jennifer and myself and many of our colleagues. Consent should not be limited to Aboriginal title cases. As we see on this slide in Haida Nation versus BC in 2004, the Supreme Court of Canada described the duty of the Crown to consult as a spectrum. And you see that at the low end, the duty to consult includes a minimum duty to discuss important decisions where the breach is relatively minor. However, at the high end, this duty 
requires, and it's again, it's on the slide at the bottom, the full consent of the Aboriginal nation on very serious issues. And it is disturbing that the Supreme Court of Canada has never ruled that full consent of the Indigenous nation is required on very serious issues. Next. Okay, oh, that's great. it for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we just wanted to speak to legislation. And um, before we get into the BC legislation, um, I wanted to mention federal legislation. So the current government um, has made a commitment to federal legislation. Uh, it was in the speech from the throne and it was in mandate letters um, as well. Um, but even before that work takes place, we wanted to point out that we already have nine different pieces of federal legislation that include a commitment to the declaration. And I, we have them on this slide in the next one. Each of these nine pieces of legislation include the clause, whereas the government of Canada is committed to implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so you see here several different pieces of legislation, including the Languages Act um, and uh, the Canada Ren Energy Regulator Act, Impact Assessment Act, um, and, and then here's the other four. So legislation including them into implementing the declaration. And now we are moving into a, uh, a phase where the federal government is going to be, has made a commitment to work with indigenous peoples to co-develop a framework for implementation legislation. Um, and that of course takes us to uh, the BC provincial legislation and the, uh, which was bill 41, now known as the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act uh, that was just adopted in November. Um, while we are not going to go through the whole bill clause by clause because we don't have time to do that, um, the bill was uh, co-developed with Indigenous peoples in BC through the First Nations Leadership Council. And um, we've highlighted a few of the provisions on this slide because we wanted to just highlight a particular aspect here that's really important. Um, this, this phrase, consultation and cooperation, this is the minimum standard that's affirmed in the declaration. So not just merely a standard of consultation, but consultation and cooperation. And of course, cooperation also implies a consensual aspect to it. Um, so this is very important because the BC legislation has this in it several times. I've, and, uh, and it's a very important element. I think the fact that BC was able to develop and adopt this uh, provincial legislation is, can be very important, can lead to very important things in the province. And um, the work obviously is only just beginning in terms of the province working with Indigenous peoples around the implementation of that legislation and around um, a provincial action plan, which is one of the uh, components um, around, uh, which then also will be leading to reporting uh, one of the components. So, uh, you know, we are, we are moving in a forward direction when we are seeing both the federal government and provincial governments um, be working this way through a legislative framework. The consultation and cooperation, one of the one of the reasons that that was the minimum standard in the UN declaration is that during the negotiations of the declaration from every region of the world, indigenous peoples rejected just using the term consultation because globally that has failed indigenous peoples. It's also worth knowing that in 2018, BC did already adopt two different pieces of legislation that included a commitment to the declaration, and that's the Environmental Assessment Act, as well as the Poverty Reduction Strategy Act. So we know that the work to implement uh, legislation, as well as the declaration as a whole, is long-term, sometimes will be very complicated, and as we are seeing right now in BC, it can be very challenging. And I just wanted to uh, uh, repeat the often quoted Senator Sinclair, the former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, who reminded us over and over again, reconciliation is hard work. And this commitment to change is going to require understanding a need to do things differently. Respecting Indigenous people's human rights, even when it's challenging to do so, 
is where we all have to go. That includes governments, third parties, including corporate interests. So in terms of implementation, legislation is really important. The fact that you have this legislation now in BC is critically important. That other provinces are also talking about legislation, critically important. Federal government, critically important. But in addition to those pieces of legislation, let implementation of rights generally happens from the ground up. So what Indigenous peoples are doing on the ground um, will be the most effective forms of implementation. Indigenous peoples can and are using the declaration in diverse ways. And on the last couple of slides here, just uh, we're just finishing, we have uh, several different ways that the declaration can be used by Indigenous peoples and other governments um, for implementation. And of course, one of the main things about implementing human rights is um, public education, educational awareness. So even webinars like this one contribute to human rights education and understanding the work that Paul and I have done with Kirby over the last several years. That's all about trying to raise awareness and that's part of the implementation work. Using the declaration in these different ways, guiding policies, guiding negotiations, and even guiding litigation, it's all critically important. Indigenous nations are also using the declaration in their own nation building and in the strengthening of their own communities. And they're using the declarations in various forms of decision-making. One of the examples we wanted to share is a recent one from Northern Quebec, where the Cree Nation government, Northern Quebec, uh, passed their own legislation. So this is Cree legislation on their uh, language act. And they use the UN declaration while doing that. So the declaration can be used in these diverse ways uh, by indigenous peoples as well as by other governments. But it's important that the declaration be used and incorporated in the various agreements that indigenous peoples um, are having with governments um, as well as with others. And of course, you know, we only mentioned a few cases here, but it's always worth doing the work to see how can the declaration assist in litigation? You know, it's one of the things as we began, you know, one of the challenges in that um, injunction order uh, is that it's not there. And, and how can it be used in litigation? How can it be used in title cases? How can it be used to be promoting Indigenous people's human rights when they're doing any of these types of initiatives to strengthen their own, uh, their own governance and their own work in their own communities? And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer and Paul. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Tara Marsden, who uh, has worn many hats, but she is currently the WILP Sustainability Director for the Gitanyao Hereditary Chiefs. So over to you. Good morning, everybody. I am just going to open my PowerPoint on my computer here. Nikki, you want to let me know when it's viewable? Yeah, we can see it in the um, in the PowerPoint mode, not the slideshow mode. How's that? Great. Perfect. You're good. Um, he who uh, thank you uh, for um, viewing the uh, the presentation today, and thank you to Nikki and Kirby for uh, hosting and convening this. And it's wonderful to hear from um, Jennifer and from Paul. And I'm going to give an, an example uh, that uh, I've been asked to share around our land use plan and the work that we've done around WILP sustainability. And so, as you've heard, this UN declaration that is an international instrument, uh, it was passed in 2007 at the UN level, and it took many years for uh, our provincial and federal crowns to adopt it and now to legislate it in, in BC. But during that time, First Nations were not sitting idly by waiting for the crown to recognize it and adopt it. Uh, First Nations were uh, acting as though uh, it were law and were acting uh, in the spirit of this declaration for many years. And I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, for our land use plan uh, specifically. Uh, the declaration really supports the vision of our hereditary chiefs. Uh, and we do have a hereditary structure that I'll tell you about that is different than the Indian Act structure uh, that many are familiar with. But we do have now also the provincial and federal crown uh, 
recognizing and legislating and uh, adopting this declaration. And so what can we do? Certainly our neighbors uh, to the east of us, the Wet'suwet'en are experiencing a much, uh, much more minimized implementation of the declaration. And so we're not uh, disillusioned that, that this is an, gonna be an automatic uh, change that is happening uh, federally and provincially. And so before I go into the details of our Lachip land use plan, I want you to think about uh, free prior informed consent, not in the way that you may have heard about it in the media as a stereotype of a First Nations veto, that First Nations are arbitrarily uh, trying to kill big projects or are being backed by um, you know, uh, foreign funders and are, are radicalized, all of these negative stereotypes that you may see. Um, around consent, around what consent means for our people. I'd like you to think of more about building blocks, building blocks of free prior informed consent. And for, for Gitnia, where I work, uh, where I'm from, our Ayuk, our Indigenous laws, are the main building block for all of the work that we do in stewarding the territory. Our Lahip land use plan is in implementation. It has been in implementation for eight years. We're currently developing a WILP sustainability assessment process, which will parallel provincial and federal environmental assessments. We also have a cultural heritage policy that's been in place since 2009. Uh, indigenous protected areas are a new uh, tool that many Indigenous nations, including Gitniao, are pursuing and uh, working not only with BC Parks, but to establish our own protected areas and our own management strategies and directions. Gitniao also is developing a wildlife strategy and water policy, looking at inventories and population uh, and habitat for wildlife, allocation decisions, using our own laws, as well as water policy to look at environmental flows in the face of climate change. How much water do we have over the next 50 years that are going to support salmon and, um, and other ecosystem functions? And the Crown does play a role. The Crown uh, with Gitniao has a recognition and reconciliation agreement with the provincial government. Uh, and that's my primary role is implementing both the land use plan and uh, the recognition and reconciliation agreement. So that just sort of lays the framework for what I'm going to go through in terms of who we are and what our land use plan means. Our territory, for those of you, I believe we have some folks from outside of British Columbia. So uh, the Gitniao Lahip or territory is in the northwest part of British Columbia. Uh, it's in two different watersheds, the, the Nath and the uh, Skeena watersheds. It's been defended and managed by the hereditary chiefs and the Huwilp for generations since time immemorial. And the way that we've documented that, we have an oral history. Uh, you may have heard of the Delgamook decision, which recognized that the Supreme Court oral histories as valid evidence. So our oral histories are not only oral, but they are documented in our Gidim Gan, which is our totem poles. And so each of the crests that you have seen on a totem pole is not just an art form. It's an actual marker of history of how the territory was established and defended uh, through war and now in our modern day through legal means. So each of our individual WILP territories uh, have uh, a pole or a Gitimgen that accompanies it. And the collective of our eight uh, WILP territories is the Gitniao Lachip. Our people uh, are referred to the collective of those eight historic WILP or house groups are known as the Gitniao Huwilp. We're organized into two clans. Uh, the clan system is very common uh, throughout the northwest coast uh, of, of BC, as well as into parts of Alaska and uh, Washington state. And so our clans in Gitniao are the Frog, the Ganetta, and the Gibu, the Wolf clan, and each Wilt belongs to one of those two clans. So individually, those Wilt have authority over their territory. And the collective is really, what are we working on together? We are Gitsan culturally. Uh, we have operated independently since the NISCA final agreement uh, to the west of us uh, affected Gitniao in such a significant way that we had to uh, operate independent of the, of the larger Gitsan. And we have recognition through uh, the provincial courts that uh, the rights and title, the constitutional rights and title holders uh, are, are through the WILP system and not only through the Indian Act ban system. And this took uh, an education process that paralleled the Delgamook decision, but the understanding at a legal level that there is legal laws that pre, uh, predated colonial laws in our territories. So how we are uh, expressing and uh, exercising our rights and title in the modern context, one way is through our land use plan, 
This plan was developed over uh, 10 years. It was negotiated with the provincial government. The provincial government did not have a mandate at the time to uh, talk to First Nations about land use planning, to include them. Uh, all consultation was happening at that point at a cut block by cut block level or an operational level only with no uh, landscape level uh, coordination. So we brought three court cases uh, on forestry issues, on consultation, and that really brought the provincial government to the table. From the provincial perspective, I've been told that Gitanyao, it was the first in BC to have a very detailed land use plan in a government to government fashion that was followed uh, by legalization in provincial legal orders. So there are many in BC uh, who have uh, land use plans, and, um, but Gitanyao, I've been told, is distinct in the way that it is detailed spatially uh, in terms of measurable targets and in the way that it was legalized uh, not only in a government to government agreement but in legal orders. So the land use plan guides all land and resource decisions on the LAHIP and it's included in a recognition reconciliation agreement signed initially in 2012 and renewed in 2016. What you see here is all of the map zonations and so when I talk about detail this is the type of detail it is not a simple uh, go and no go zones although that is a part of it but we have um, multiple land use zones and values uh, those habitats are mapped uh, to a detailed level we have official shape files that accompany those that the government and get now use the intention is to maintain the connectivity to maintain these habitats in um, a properly functioning manner to manage for cumulative effects to not only consult at the operational or cut block by cut block level and to ensure wilp sustainability which i'll define for you later and really we've used scientific tools and um, uh, technical uh, mechanisms such as this to actually act as proxy for our Aboriginal rights and title. So where we have a scientific measurement of ecosystem function, we know that if ecosystems are functioning, that means that fish are thriving, that moose are thriving, that plants and medicines are thriving, and therefore Gitanya will continue to be able to exercise rights and title. So further to those zones mapped, uh, these are some of the zones. There are others, but I can't go into full detail today. Uh, Anjokal Lagans is our grizzly bear habitat. Anjokal Mech is our mountain goat winter range. NC Wijok is the Gitanyao cultural sites. And Tlotl Samax is our water management units. Pine mushrooms. Uh, Khada is our moose and moose winter range. NC Winech is our ecosystem networks and Amatel are our cedar reserves. And the big changes prior to the land use plan to post land use plan really are around the Antlutosamax and NC Winech, our e ecosystem networks and our water management units. And so those areas previously were really damaged and targeted by forestry. We had companies logging right down to the riparian zones. We had roads being built in steep terrain causing erosion uh, downstream. And we had uh, changes in the um, in the hydrology and the morphology of key rivers and streams for spawning habitat. So we now have protection of those key areas and we have uh, recognition and, and detailed maps for all of the other zones and management directions that go with those. So overall um, combining those areas that are no-go zones um, we now have a protection of 44% of our territory from forestry and other industrial development. This was done without a treaty, without a final settlement, um, and we have been uh, effective at implementing and ensuring this is followed for the past eight years. In the areas in the green that you see, those operable areas, those are not um, free for all. They're not um, open for any type of activity. They have management constraints on them as well. Um, including some snow requirements, the activation of roads in some cases, equivalent clear-cut areas, and watershed thresholds. Uh, one area that has been established as a conservancy through our land use plan is uh, referred to as Hani Talk in our language, which is our food table. Uh, it refers to the Hannah and Tintina Mesiaden area and is protected as a conservancy. It's about 24,000 hectares. Um, and it uh, historically would protect 80% of Nass River sockeye spawning. It also has grizzly, critical grizzly bear habitat and large number of Gitanyao sites. 
cultural sites. Uh, there was disturbance from past logging. We are doing restoration on that work. But what we are finding is that uh, climate change has made one creek uh, to the west of the lake that you see on your screen much more suitable for uh, spawning uh, habitat because of deglaciation and because of lower snowpacks in the Hannah and Tantina creeks. So we're looking at an indigenous protected area around this area because the rate of change uh, to adapt for these types of climate change um, occurrences uh, within the provincial government is much too slow and we need to act independently as an indigenous nation. So overall, the plan is intended to ensure, as I mentioned, ecosystem function, and that has a dual meaning, scientifically and in our own culture. So ecosystem function can be measured scientifically. Uh, we have done that on two occasions. We have uh, ensured that the, um, the, will, uh, the land use plan has been uh, effective at reducing long-term risk. But we also need to know that, that is a, uh, it is a proxy for our WILP to be able to live off of their own individual territory. If one WILP is degraded or damaged to a point that they can no longer uh, support fish and wildlife and clean water, then that goes against our laws and we need to ensure both scientifically and culturally WILP sustainability. In terms of implementation, uh, as I mentioned, it's been eight years. We have an engagement framework with the province of British Columbia. We have a joint resources council, which I'm a co-chair of, and senior to that, a joint resources governance forum. We also have dispute resolution, and it's based on our WILP DECET, which is our authority. Um, of each individual will to make their own decision. And so myself as a technical person or as a, as a, uh, a staff, I can make a recommendation. The final decision lays with the will. And the land use plan is the filter for all decisions on the territory for the shared decision making. And in reference to uh, the declaration, the UN declaration, this is a consensus seeking process. And so we are trying to reach consensus. But at the end of the day, if we don't, the province is very comfortable going off and making their own decision and having the, you know, the police and the army to back them. We don't have those same um, brute force uh, resources behind us anymore. And so um, it is, uh, at times we are in dispute and at times we are still in court uh, regardless of the shared decision making framework. We're seeking to enhance this uh, over the next year in an enhanced agreement where we are uh, seeking consent based decision making. One of the big, biggest successes that we have achieved is working directly with licensees or forest companies in our territory. Uh, and this is because uh, licensees, they want simplicity, they want predictability and certainty, and a land use plan provides that. And uh, while the province may, uh, in the early days, have been hung up on um, uh, sort of minimizing what's in the land use plan when they were drafting their legal orders, companies just wanted to know what the rules were and how they could follow them to, to get access to fiber. So currently we have 100% compliance with our land use plan with the licensees that are currently operating in the territory. We also uh, don't want to see, uh, our chiefs have never said we wanted to shut down development at all uh, or, or completely. We want to see local jobs and a lot of our wood has previously been exported as raw logs overseas. And so in our agreements, we try to ensure a right of first refusal to our local mills, two mills, as well as two get now projects um, we're trying to pursue to reduce uh, waste in the forest as there's a lot of waste when you are, are exporting raw logs uh, for export. And uh, Gitniao does have two forest licenses that we try to um, ensure sustainable development over, um, over time, including local employment and partnerships. Uh, also with licensees, we do early engagement. And, and so the intention there is that before a company goes to the Crown for a permit, they come to us. And uh, all of the issues are generally worked out before they go to the Crown. And the Crown can become a mere bystander in some of the uh, consultation decisions that occur. Over the next year, we'll be developing a compliance and monitoring framework uh, for forestry in the territory. Uh, we're using technology, iPads, that we can go out and navigate and ensure that forestry is compliant after the fact. Uh, this doesn't happen um, at a crown level, uh, and so we need to take this on ourselves uh, and uh, will be developed over the next year. And all of this really goes to um, what many people know of as an adaptive management approach. 
and what many governments claim that they are using. But in, in fact, uh, what we have witnessed is a, is a more linear approach that governments deal with a crisis um, like the Wet'suwet'en, for example, or a different court case on lands and resources issues. And they deal with that, they negotiate, and then they walk away once the agreement's been signed. But what's needed to effectively manage for sustainability is a negotiation, establishing those common values and objectives, developing a plan and legalizing it in Indigenous and colonial laws, implementation, and then monitoring. And what do you do with that scientific data or that cultural data that you're gathering? You adapt and you modify based on changes in the landscape, based on changing climates um, and economies. And then you go back to the negotiation table to update that plan. And so it's a much different approach uh, and it's one that is, is needed. Uh, we've, been, we've been asked many times to present on this plan. And so I think there's a real appetite for this type of government to government uh, land use planning and implementation. And with that, I'd just like to say Hamia and our information is available on our website. And um, I'm happy to answer questions during the discussion portion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. That was really insightful. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from uh, a member of the Haniguichin uh, from the Silkateen Nation, uh, Loretta Williams, who is also um, Chair of First Nations Women Advocating for Responsible Mining. So, Loretta. Good morning, everyone. Get this started here. It looks so, good. Um, okay. So, I'm from um, the Hanukkotin First Nations government, which is um, one of six Shelcoton communities within interior British Columbia, and um, and was raised by my grandparents. So, um, of course, with that, um, I've been taught all of the traditional laws that they were taught um, as children as well. So, we carry that forward in our work, and um, you know, we're very close to. Our environment and we we live in our um, right in our communities so um, we hold that very very close to our heart so as I'd mentioned earlier I'm from the Chilcot Nation which is interior BC um, there's six communities and we have two river systems which are which um, salmon um, come back to every year for their spawning so that is something that we will always protect because our our families are very much dependent on that. Um, where I come from, the Maya Valley, Jerry Christine, we have the backdrop of the coastal mountains. Um, the picture there is Choco Lake, and it's the largest um, freshwater body, highest elevation lake in British Columbia. And um, that's where our salmon um, come back to spawn. We're very much connected to the land. Um, we are very remote, my community is very remote, so um, we are very rich in our language, traditions, culture. All of our meetings are held in the Chilcotin language and um, translated to English if need be. And, um, and you know, we're still working on, um, on teaching our youth um, what we know, so we take every opportunity possible to do that. Um, our population is about 4,000 in, in the entire Chilcot Nation, and um, we have a long history of protecting our, um, our territory. So just some history about our people and why, why, why we're doing the things we are today. So um, back in the 1800s, when con contact was just starting, um, there was a road that was going to be built through our territory and um, it was going to come in from Vancouver and would come right into my um, my my community, the Hanukkah And so um, in the beginning, you know, we were working with them. We were on their their road crew. We were assisting with with help with um, building the road. And um, and of course, things started going difficult. Things started getting difficult. Um, the road crew was um, 
was not respectful of our our our, our nation. You know, they started showing showing this in the end, and and um, they started taking advantage of our women, and um, and also kidnapping them and um and our of course our nation wouldn't have that so we began protecting our women you know our life givers and um and once we started that they started um to impose smallpox because they wanted to get rid of us we were we were in their way but um our Chalcotin leaders at the time um imposed war on them and Platzus Ein, um, we've, he's always known for this one quote, we meant war, not murder. We were, we, st- we struck war on that, on that, that whole crew to protect our, our women and children in our territory. So they, they turned around to this day, that road has not been built. And um, we had to ensure, I guess all these years, the, um, aftermath like the aftermath of that Chilcotin war um our chiefs were promised a peace treaty and they were tricked into turning themselves in and they were hung within a week's time and and so all of our oral history all of our women have all shared that story from generation to generation from 1864 and um and just held on to that I guess that grief in in that time of history and to this day I can still when I talk about it I can almost come to tears still the hurt is still there and so when we won title um, we had to we had to find a way around that that grief and that hurt and so we um, we won title and we started negotiations with BC and Canada and so we asked them to apologize um, for the wrongdoings of like hanging of, of our of our chiefs back in 1864, and so um, we we had a few ceremonies over the years, and the last one was with Canada um, in November um, 20, 2018. So we've always been um, at the forefront of protecting our lands, and the, our recent. Um, our recent fight that we're still in yet is protecting Fish Lake, um, South Pond Bay, as we call it in our language. And um, it was um, a mining company wanting to build an open pit gold and copper mine in the heart of our territory, and it's it's right above our spawning grounds of the of the salmon. And you know, like we did in initially, we. You know, they came and they asked us to participate in the environmental assessments. And um, we did, you know, back then, this was prior to UNDRIP. And, and, but we knew that, um, that we had a choice whether this mine should go through or not. And so we, we went ahead. We did our homework. You know, we did our due diligence. We, we went through the environmental assessment um, to check out the pros and cons of the project in our area, like whether we'd, how much would be impacted and how much would also benefit us. So we went through years of, of testing, water testing, you know, testing of our whole area, doing a baseline study. And um, in the end, our people said, no, this is not, this is not the right time. This is not the right place. You know, we're not against mining, but um, this was the wrong place for this mine. So at that point, we fully opposed the project, and and then from there, um, we won two environmental assessments um, with the help of Ken and their decision. Um, they list, listened to us closely, and they they looked at all the scientific work that had been done in that area, and it was decided that this mine could not go through. And um, to this day, we're still um, in courts and whatnot with the mining company in question. And so we're still fighting and, you know, we will continue to. We told them that we're going to we're going to be here forever. You know, we're we're not giving up. And and um, it's mining companies like the one that we're dealing with that that have a bad name in this industry right now because um, they just chose not to work with us at all. And and. Um, so it's a, it's been a concern for the last 
since 2005. Prior to that was exploration. Um, I thought this was a really neat, really neat um, article that had been done by National Geographic. So Chilcot River is one of the rivers that go through our territory and it has approximately 1 million returning salmon every year. Um, they travel 805 kilometers to reach um, the lake that I had a, a picture of earlier. And they're dubbed superfish um, as they are found to have larger than normal hearts and healthy cardiovascular systems, which better equips them for climate change. So they have a long ways to go. And, you know, like they, we de depend on these salmon very much and, you know, we will for forever protect them. And, you know, there's, an, there's a lot of things that are happening right now that are impacting our salmon getting to their spawning grounds. So we're always on the lookout for whatever impacts our health and wellness. So as I've mentioned earlier, we, we won a title case um, in 2014, June 26. And um, after being years, being through court um, for approximately 20 years, we had um, a number of our people um, testify on, on our territory. And so the Supreme Court of Canada rendered historic judgment of the Chilcot Nation's Aboriginal title case. Um, the court declared Aboriginal title to approximately 1,900 um, square kilometers in my territory. Um, first time in Canadian history, the court rejected the postage stamp view of Aboriginal title once and for all. So we have an agreement now. We've had a number of agreements since then, but our last one is called Gwits and Neil E, which is which means transformative change agreement. And within that agreement, we have a lot of different um, tools to use um, for um, making decision making. And so, um, like you know, we have land use planning within. We have. Um, we will go through like our everything that's within our communities, like whether it be health, education, um, governance, creating our own laws. And so that's within my territory, but there's five other communities that don't have that. But um, we also have within the agreement, we have um, category A and B lands. Category A lands is where we will choose our own community, or the other communities will choose an area like the title area within their own communities. And that's, um, that will ensure full decision-making power within, our, within um, our land. So a lot of work to be done over the years and this agreement was just signed last, um, last winter. So we're just starting now with the meetings with regards to this agreement. So here's a map of the Tsaikotin Tidal Land. Um, here's BC, and there's a tidal land there. And here's another close shot of it. So all the river systems here, this is Choco Lake, and the river systems there, which we protect. So I know um, it was, this was all covered earlier as well, but you know, doing business, we have a document um, that, that lays out the steps for engagement. and and it this it this goes for any business that is coming into our area. Um, so you know, engage early. Let let us know of your, your intentions. Um, learn about us. You know, you need to learn about the nation that you're you're going to be building in. So that's very important in order to build the trust that's needed to to carry that project out. If that community wants that project, so. After all that is done, then you can sign an MOU and develop the project if that's how far it's going to go. And, you know, relationships are forged and then, like, um, healthy projects can be moved forward. But if you don't have all this, then it will, things will be tied up in court for years, like, like with the, the project, the mining company that I was speaking about earlier. You know, um, we've been tied up in court for many years. And so it's very expensive uh, and time consuming, you know, so that is a lesson learned um, for bo on both sides. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you're gonna work in First Nations territory, you need to respect everything about them, their title and their rights. They have a lot, we have a lot of rights, um, you know, as, as indigenous people. 
um, do all over the world. You know, we depend on the land in which we live and um, whether it be um, hunting and fishing and, and, um, and berry picking and like Tara had mentioned earlier, land use planning, we all, all of our communities have land use planning and, and used in following that land use plan is very important. Respecting traditional laws, um, each each of our nations have our own respect our traditional laws that you know some some might not be written but some but some are written, and these laws have been has have been um, handed down um, for years and years and you know I I I learned them from my grandparents and and you know we're we're taught we we teach them to our children as they as they grow up you know you respect the water um keep that clean because you know we we depend on that and and um when you're hunting and fishing only take as much as you need and 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 same with uh, medicine gathering and our traditions like the drum we hold very close to our heart and our prayers to the creator um if you don't follow those those traditional laws within within a First Nations territory, then you will, conflicts will arise. And we've seen that over the years since time of memorial. Like we saw like what I explained about the Chilcotin War, we weren't being respected. You know, if, if we had been respected during that whole process, the road would have been in place. If they had not started touching our women and um, then we would, you know, we would have backed off and we would have allowed that road to go through. But once things started getting out of hand, then you know we have to step forward and defend um, what we love. So you see it like here in this slide, the Oka crisis, um, the Unistoten camp, um, who we support very much. You know, as First Nations people, we support one another. And so if you if you um, disrespect us, then you're going to have to deal with all of the First Nations that are um, that are that are assisting us in the fight too. So, you know, the Amazon deforestation, that is such a tragedy right there. And of course, this was discussed earlier, so I won't go too much into this, but under um, the prior informed consent, you know, we ensure that, um, that this is included within all of our agreements. And, um, you know, we, we listen to um, the ministers speak at, at meeting like right now i'm at gather gathering of wisdom in, in vancouver and um and we had two ministers speak um here and so they are presenting to 500 people here and so we ensure that they stick to um what they've said at these meetings like that they're going to implement and drip and how they're going to go about doing that. So we we make sure that they stick to their mandates and their words. And as a Zaykoti nation, we meet with them quite regularly as well. So we we ensure that um you know that they stick to their words and all of our agreements. You know all our meetings we pr we have practically have to teach them on what on what consent and and um, you know free prior informed consent is. Um, they're learning so um it's taken us years you know so far to to get to where we are today and you know it's not all it's not all roses yet um we still have a lot of challenges and um and like we, we still have a challenge of um fighting for telton b with the mining company but and then we're we're always um putting creating new initiatives. Um, we have a tribal park within our territory as well. And um, we, and it's an area that is protected. And you know, like if we want to have um, logging within that area, it's gonna be our, with our consent. And we're going to tell them how, how they're gonna do it. Um, so we also have agreements, other agreements with the government. Um, the Aikodine Stewardship Agreement, which deals with with um, all of the referrals and um, from industry, um, whether it be forestry, mining, um, even building a dock, you know, it's 
it's submitted into a portal that we created. And so we have staff that look look at all of those referrals and they're um, they're looked at like how serious they are and how much um, consultation will be needed throughout. So it's something that we've created and 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 work with. Um, these are guess some of the next next steps that we are that we will be um, I guess we'll we'll ensure that we have a say in how the, all all of this falls out. So Bill 41, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act that has just been um, approved, the new law to uphold Indigenous rights in BC. BC is one of the first jurisdictions in the world to implement under it. So um, some steps that will be taken um, in the next year, probably year, a year or two to come is all BC laws must line up with the declaration. That's going to take a long time, you know, and it's going to take a lot of push. Um, and uh, all of the Indigenous people in BC will ensure that the um, BC government um, goes through with this. Government is to develop an impl implementation action plan. Um, an annual progress report will be developed. Um, and this will provide, they'll provide for certain statutory decisions to be made jointly. So, though that is what's up and coming, um, and you know, like like I said earlier, you know, there's always initiatives that we put forward on our own behalf, and Tribal Park was one of them. But we also have um, created a solar farm, and it's the largest in BC. And um, you know, it's we're going to create power that's going to be um, injected into the BC hydro system. So it's. Um, been a long time coming and a lot of our communities like the community that I come from is not is not um, we're not hooked into the BC hydro grid so we we um, we have our own um, solar system solar farm in our in our area that we depend on so with the last slide um, you know mutual respect is the foundation of genuine harmony so that's Dalai Lama um, quote, and I would like to thank you all, and I'd like to thank um, Nikki and Kirby for inviting me to speak here today. Thank you so much, Loretta. Maybe if you stop sharing your screen, then we can go back and see all the panelists. Thank you. Um, so moving to question and answer, we just have um, about 20 minutes left. Uh, so, um, and we've had a few qu great questions come in. Hopefully we can get to as many as possible. Um, one of, uh, Loretta, you sort of had highlighted there too at the end, towards the end of your presentation about how BC's UN Declaration Bill 41 is to review existing BC legislation and policies. And I'm just wondering from uh, your perspective and Tara's perspectives, um, what are what are a couple of priorities that you see that need to be updated uh, in the near future to align better with the UN Declaration? Well, um, there's one that we're dealing with right now um, that we've always had problems with, and it's the online staking of um, and and what it is 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 anybody can go online and stake in whoever's territory, anybody's backyard, um, it could be your own backyard that, the, that I could stake in and go exploring for whatever. So, and it's very cheap and it's too easy to do in, in, my, in my view. Um, we would like that, it's a part of our, our initiatives for mining reform, we need to deal with that because that's where the problem lies. And, you know, if you're gonna work in somebody's territory, you need to, you need to um, to contact them even before you stake. Where um, even before you you have to like speak to them before of your intentions before you stake online. So it's it's a very disrespectful um, process that's happening there, and um, that's one of the things that we're working on. Tara can probably add to that. Sure. 
Uh, yeah, similar to Loretta, uh, the Mineral Tenure Act uh, that she's referring to is, is probably one of the uh, most colonial outdated pieces of legislation in the province. And we have, uh, in our case, a land use plan that speaks to forestry. Forestry is under quite a bit of scrutiny and, and is, is fairly well regulated. Um, there are definitely some instances um, where there could be improvements, but uh, the, the mining sector definitely has a free hand in BC still and as part of our, our our colonial legacy and so there were efforts uh, last year to reform the Mineral Tenure Act uh, due to pressure from uh, industry that was um, put on hold and so you know ideas around updating our land use plan to include a mineral layer where mineral exploration is allowed and where it's not um, that was a, a proposal that we put forward and um, really we're seeing um, in in areas uh, that are critical spawning habitat you know climate change um, opening up new areas areas and making them more viable and then we have a bunch of mineral tenures laid right over top of them and the argument when we try and protect that area now is that well we'd have to compensate these mineral tenure holders in in millions of dollars just to protect an area where we did not have any um, say in that uh, to begin with uh, where those mineral tenures were established so it, it is definitely a priority um, there are current updates to the forest range practices act that are underway um, and again, those were done concurrently while the, uh, the declaration um, legislation was being drafted. And so it would have been um, better maybe to pause that uh, or to plan at least for uh, post uh, DRIPA legislation and how um, the Forest and Range Practices Act could be updated um, with more meaningful engagement with um, with First Nations. So it may be a lost opportunity there um, and having to reopen it again. It doesn't it doesn't happen very often, but I think overall we don't want to see a delay. We don't want to see a work planning uh, that the province is talking about sort of take take years and years before we even get to our first piece of legislation. I think that's my main uh, objective. Okay, i okay, uh, got a couple, couple questions here um, around the, the declaration. What fed Canada's initial opposition to the declaration and uh, how does Canada legally determine self-government? Paul or Jennifer? Well, I'll go first. Um, you said what has fed? What has? Well, why did Canada initially oppose the UN Declaration? What was their reluctance to sign it? Well, they were. Canada was opposed during much of the initial negotiations, and it was basically what seemed to dominate is the lack of communication or discussion between the government and Indigenous peoples and their representatives. And they just opposed. And uh, they formed a little clique, which was made up of Canada, United States, New Zealand, and um, Australia. And they thought they could oppose it right till the end. So that's why they were the four countries that voted against. It was basically bait uh, based on no, little or no dialogue, no question but opposition, and um, slowly towards the end of that process, things began to change. And when we started talking together and uh, working more together, there's been more openings. But um, for them to be the only countries in the world to oppose, is a pretty shameful legacy. So hopefully we're going to see federal legislation, uh, hopefully also more provincial legislation across the country on the UN Declaration and also in the territories. Thanks. And maybe just follow, following the, the, the question, one of, was sort of how does Canada legally determine self-government and in addition to that, Tara, maybe you can answer what was the process of having the WILP system recognized as the rights and title holders? Jennifer or? Either or. Okay. Um, well, I'll start. They, I mean, their view of self-government, because they didn't really 
the government didn't really have a legal basis and they did not really wish to discuss it. I should mention uh, during the eight or nine years of the Harper government, there were no discussions. We weren't even, they, they did not believe that the declaration was a human rights instrument or that indigenous peoples had human rights, but no civil servant was allowed to even discuss their position that indigenous rights are not human rights. So that type of blockage, and we saw, we saw it continue when uh, Romeo Saganash's bill to implement the UN Declaration went to the Senate, both in the House and in the Senate. It was only the Conservatives that blocked the legislation. All other parties were in favor solidly. So again, if it's based just on political positions, human rights aren't going to advance. And now that we have progressive governments and, and in progressive examples like British Columbia and, and Canada, hopefully the whole country will start to embrace human rights for indigenous peoples and not continue or perpetuate colonialism. I think just to add to that really quickly in terms of what the question was um, around, uh, uh, and I think that the, the question tying into, in terms of self-government, and is that, is that just Indian Act bans or is that um, traditional governments? Um, the declaration, because it's drafted for global, um, indigenous peoples globally, of course, it's not speaking to the way any one particular state uh, the political environment in that in that state. So when we're talking about indigenous peoples, um, that's obviously uh, speaking to how indigenous peoples, and that's that is in the declaration. Indigenous peoples have the right to um, to make those definitions for themselves. So indigenous peoples define how they are going to define themselves, um, and whether that's through a traditional governance model, whether that's um, through uh, um, you know, a more, a more uh, recent um, imposed model of governance that is now being used, um, or whether it's through a combination of which. It's up to Indigenous peoples themselves to make those decisions. And the Declaration doesn't speak to, um, uh, you know, it, the, the Declaration isn't saying, yes, it's the Indian Act bans that have the right of self-government. That isn't something, because it is an international instrument, it's a global instrument. It's up for indigenous peoples themselves to make that definition. Tara, do you wanna? Sure. Um, so the way, specifically with Gitniao, the way the WILP system, uh, traditional governance system was recognized was through those forestry court cases that I mentioned. And so we provided evidence of who we were, of our system. Um, this was after the Delgamuk decision. And so the courts already had a framework for understanding what a hereditary chief was, what a Dao was, what an oral history was, um, what a WILP was. And so um, we built on that legal precedent and uh, the, the courts recognized um, in the Walitsk decision uh, as well as the Guaslam decision in um, the mid to 2000s that the WILP is the primary socio-economic unit or, or sort of entity of the Gitniao. And so that recognition allowed the province to then say okay we can go forward and enter into these type of recognition and reconcilia reconciliation agreements with Gitniao. However, the, the federal crown though is a little different. Um, they have been at the, at the treaty table with us, um, with the hereditary chiefs, uh, since we entered into the treaty process. We're not anywhere near a final agreement, but um, they are there. They are not uh, saying that the band has to represent the Gitniao. But what they have come back uh, through negotiations at uh, with us is this, this line of thinking that, yes, we'll recognize your hereditary system, but we want to make sure that it doesn't violate the Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, and so we need to understand, you know, the role of women. We need to understand uh, how democracy works. And so the Gitniao Constitution in uh, 2009 documents that. That's available publicly if anyone's interested on our website as well. And so we went through that process in describing the rights of our WILP members and describing the processes uh, that happen in our hereditary system. And so uh, Canada still, though, has that concern that if they are entering into formal agreements, that there may be uh, risks uh, with the Charter of Rights. Interesting. 
Um, so thank you to the group in Brazil who is attending. Uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, and one of the questions from there is from a journalist. So Loretta, I don't know if you want to take the first stab at um, at answering this, but the question was around, you know, how can um, how can how can journalists do better? How can the media do better at covering indigenous governance and laws? And you know, I think two people are are thinking about the Wet'suwet'en right now. And that, you know, framing things as conflict between band council, hereditary chiefs, and that sort of thing. But um, maybe you have some insights that you'd like to share. Or when media have worked well with you and examples, bad, uh, good yeah. examples. Yeah, there's good and bad examples, of course, right? But um, I think just forming a relationship, like with, because over the years, we've had a number of different um, media people come in and ask for a tour of the territory. And then we'd give them a tour out to our, um, you know, to Fish Lake or to um, the rivers or whatever they wanted to see. And we just form a relationship with them. And I know not, not all communities can do this, but um, I guess probably just ensuring that, you know, you get to know the the media people that would tell a good story, you know, and, you know, I know like Norwal, for example, like they're very good, but they also get called down by industry because Norwal like tells the truth. <laughs> and so, you know, and then there's APTN, I have friends within APTN and, and, you know, we call on them to, to tell a story if we need one told. And so it's, I guess it's just, like, just, just creating that relationship and, and reaching out to the ones that you trust that can tell their story properly. Tara? Anyone else want to add anything on that one? I, I'd just like to add too that I, I think it's up to the state. I mean, you know, here in Wet'suwet'en territory, we see the RCMP um, blocking some uh, of the uh, journalists from entering the territory. So uh, I, I'm not sure what it's like in Brazil, but, um, you know, making sure that the journalists are able to uh, document what's happening on the ground is, is a huge part of it. Um, so we, I think we might have time for one more question. Uh, and so maybe I'll try to combine a couple. <laughs> um, uh, someone said that, you know, we've been talking a lot about how, um, you know, what happens when a colonial government or a proponent wants to do something on indigenous land, but does UNDRIP also, the UN declaration, um, also recognize the rights of indigenous peoples to make laws independently of the crown. And they give an example of, could a traditional government pass a law to protect whales in their territory, even if colonial governments have no such laws or interest in such laws? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that the thing about the declaration is because it's an international instrument, it's very broad. And so um, it's, it, there. this, absolutely. I mean, indigenous peoples have the right to their own governance, their own, um, their own uh, forms of legal traditions, um, and and all there's many different rights that are in the declaration that speak to the fact that indigenous governance, of course, can be enacting their own laws. Um, where then the question actually is is what happens if an indigenous law isn't necessarily supported by a colonial government, um, and this is why I think that uh, as particularly now in BC. BC's already passed this legislation saying we're going to bring our laws, um, you know, into alignment and we're going to work in um, cooperation with Indigenous peoples on this implementation plan. So then how do you make that happen? How do you ensure that colonial laws are not undermining Indigenous laws? And this is the challenge before us right now um, and right now in front of the province of British Columbia. And I think that it is, um, uh, does the declaration support that in terms of indigenous governance, of course. But then I think that it's it's about this finding our ways to move forward, um, finding those ways forward that is in a cooperative manner, but where indigenous people's rights are being respected. Where we have to break out, where Canada, where British Columbia, Canada, and a good deal of the world need to break out of this model of dominance, where there's a belief that colonial governments um, get to dominate simply because they're colonial governments. 
And that's the model that has to be broken. Um, and uh, the paradigm that we have to be moving into is a model where there's respect for Indigenous people's rights. Um, so if, if Indigenous peoples, if they have passed a law and they, and they feel that the colonial governments are not respecting that, there has to be a space where the conversations, where the negotiation can be happening, like what Tara was explaining and the different types of processes that they're using. Those spaces have to exist so that the conversations are happening um, so people can get to a conclusion where all sides um, can, uh, can agree with the conclusion. And where I think that it's important, to, I was noticing when uh, in one of the important aspects of Tara's presentation, when she commented about, you know, and if, but if we're not agreeing, the state thinks that they still have the, you know, the power to, to basically trump uh, and, and what we see happening in, with, in Wet'suwet'en territory. And, and that can't be the end of the story. Right, that the, the declaration was exactly developed by indigenous peoples around the world so that that is not the end of when, if we get to a point and a colonial government says, well, no, we don't agree with you and we get to have the last say, you know, that, that's, that's totally wrong. And so the whole point of indigenous peoples spending those decades going to Geneva to develop an international instrument was to change that pattern. And I think that, you know, we have to, um, we have to encourage uh, uh, BC, other provinces in Canada to be moving in that direction of saying, um, we are changing the paradigm. We aren't going to use a colonial model anymore. We are now, we are in a model now where we recognize that we are, we are respecting Indigenous peoples' human rights. We're working with Indigenous peoples to implement and see what does that exactly look like. And even when it's hard, um, we're going to find our way through it. Um, and so I think, I think that's the moment that we are sitting in right now. I think I'll just add a little bit to this. Um, like for our nation, unity is key. Um, we have six Chilcotin communities and our chief and communities work very closely. And so we had to create a, a law, like of course, for our declaration area, um, for our title area. And, and so that has been done, but we know that that's the easy part, but it's the other five, it's the other area within our Chilcotin area that is still not, we still don't have title over yet, so we still struggle with that, but unity is key. We've signed um, an agreement like amongst a few of our communities and then also the carrier community just, to, just north of us on um, moose hunting, for example, is, is the most recent one where we said we don't want any moose hunting within our territory. So, um, We've signed an agreement and it's out in public, like there's absolutely no hunting. Um, there's some rules within that, you know, like you can hunt um, bull moose, but no cow moose are to be hunted. And it's just working with your neighbors is key. And also um, in, you know, in getting the RCMP, RCMP involved, um, we let them know of our ten intentions. So because like right now we're, we, we have a shortfall for enforcement because um, we have we have guardians out on the land, but they are they are unable to um, enforce like um, the laws that we have put forward. So right now we have the RCMP very much involved um, in our initiatives and as well as uh, the conservation officers within the area. So we we have um, them that are assisting us, but not on all fronts. But you know they're they're coming around, so that's very important. I just wanted to add that bit. Thanks. All right, well, um, our, our time is up. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, in particular, Jennifer, Paul, Tara, and Loretta, and Kirby. Thank you, Nikki. <laughs> um, and uh, thanks to everybody who tuned in. Um, we might have missed a couple of questions there. Um, uh, potential, I think when you end the meeting, you should get a survey. And we would love it if you filled it out, if you have any other ideas for future webinars or maybe lingering questions that you have. But uh, thanks everybody for joining and, yeah. and uh, thanks to everyone, have a great day. We'll follow up. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.